Okay, we are live. Sebastian Fandora upsets Tim Tzu. It's Tim Tzu for those that don't know. Dakota, why don't you break down what you saw? I can tell you right now, I did not see that shit coming on a whole different, on a bunch of different levels. First of all, I think I'm stating the obvious. That's one of the bloodiest, if not the bloodiest fight I've ever seen in my life in boxing. Um, I definitely didn't think Fundora would win. I definitely didn't think he would box and use his length. As much of a physical fight as it was, he really did kind of keep the fight on, at the end of his jab and then an arm's length and seeing him kind of do that and use some of his natural gifts for the first time in the biggest fight of his career was very impressive, but it was also very impressive watching Zhu respond in it, it, to what was really like a pretty gnarly injury to have in a fight. And the I, I was shocked that this shit didn't get called a couple of different times just because it was like, at what point do you call the fight? If he can't see it all, like if that was a, directly above his eye and he couldn't see, they'd call it. So at what point do you call the fight? <laughs> so, so many different directions to go, but I think the first one I want to go with is the role of the cut man in this fight. What did you think of the job the cut man did with Tim Zhu? Because I'm not going to disparage the guy, but at the same time, salute us. Um, private chat, Mike's hot. Okay, that means I came in. Okay, Mike better? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's part of why I put it in a private chat. But you know. <laughs> Well, no, no, no. There is no private chat yeah, with our viewers. Um, what did you think of the role of the cut man for Tim Zhu and the fact that guys like Mike Basil, uh, Jacob Stitch Duran, or Mike Rodriguez, who all were in the venue, did not serve as the cut man, that it was a cut man that I had not heard of working on this cut that occurred very early in this fight? Yeah, I mean, he didn't do a great job, right? I mean, Tim had about 15 seconds of vision at the beginning of every round before his face was completely covered in blood, so... You know, I felt like whatever he was doing had very minimal effect. And I think that the amount of blood and how quickly it happened, it just changed the tone of the fight. I think it was like round three or four was kind of unhinged and they were really banging it out. Fandora's nose and mouth was starting to leak real bad. And it 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 wasn't that I don't know if Zoo lost his composure, but it just changed the terms of the fight completely. How much is the result merited on the clash to the head, like the cut? Right. I, I, It's tough to say. And the, I guess the reason that it's tough to say is because Fundora, the damage that Fundora took in the fight, too, was so over the top. It was like such an unhinged level of blood going on that it's hard for me to say there was any advantage one way or the other. Right. Because I know obviously it had to have not felt good. I'm sure that shit hurt, but they were both leaking. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I couldn't say if, if Fondora's face was clean the whole time, maybe it's an advantage. But Fondora's facial structure got rearranged. I like I get that, but at the same time, Tim Zoo basically was blind for half of the round, every round. More I thought that it was a fight where both cut men didn't really excel personally. So I thought that it was, it was a fight in which you had two warriors gutting it out in circumstances where they didn't really get the benefit of the doubt. You know, they both suffered a lot of injuries. What do you think this does for both fighters legacies? Because I think Fandora was being written off as kind of like a guy that got knocked out to Mendoza this is a guy that doesn't live up to his potential. Tim Zhu is looking like a rising star. Now it kind of puts a monkey wrench. And then the fact that Errol Spence gets in the ring to kind of do some weird promo with him. But I believe there's a rematch clause with um, Tim Zhu. It kind of felt directionless, I guess, leading out of the pay-per-view. Yeah, it felt very directionless. I think... It's so obvious that this has got to be a rematch. I think that that's incredibly obvious. One, because of the circumstances 
of the cut and the elbow and and I just think that when you have a fight that's like that, you have to run it back. Because I the truth is I feel better about Fundora. I don't really feel any differently about Zoo just because the fact that he was able to get through 12 rounds of that, I think speaks to his character. It wasn't his best performance as a boxer, but I think that some of that has to do with the blood and some of that has to do with the fact that Fundora used his length for the first time in his career, or at least in his professional career that I've watched him. Have y'all ever seen a fight where an accidental foul changed the course of a fight and affected an outcome like this? Dakota. Mm. I think um, one that comes to mind, maybe not in the same way, but it was uh, Fernando Vargas and Shane Mosley. I remember Fernando's eye got real fucked up. Maybe it was the first one. And ultimately that did wind up kind of culminating in a knockout because his vision was impaired. Uh, you know, the Lennox Lewis and Vitaly Klitschko, but that winds up uh, getting stopped. You know, I can't think of one this obvious. I mean, it's it. The unfortunate thing is, like, Tim Zhu basically was landing a lot of right hands and winning pretty dominantly the first couple of rounds. He gets cut, and then the fight dramatically changes. And it's forever going to be a chicken and the egg argument of mm -hmm. what would have happened. And which why they have to run it back. And I think that's why they have to run it back. But I think the other thing is the excitement around this fight wasn't high. If we're being honest, we as hardcore fight fans tuned in. We And it, it was a dramatic fight. I think it was probably the best fight of the month. But it also wasn't a fight that I think that a lot of people are going to be like, man, I can't wait to see this fight and watch it and whatever. It kind of sits in a weird place in the sport of boxing where I don't really know, like you run this fight back, but is this a pay-per-view fight? It has to by necessity, but it feels like this was a fight to lead into a fight against a really big name. And instead now we're getting a rematch kind of because maybe the quote unquote result that was desired didn't happen. And that's something I'm grappling with. Well, and also the fact that I don't think it was like a definitive win for Fundora. I mean, I scored it 6-6. I don't know how you had it coming in to the 12th, but I thought it was basically a draw. I didn't feel like it was real definitive one way or the other. There was these swings. I felt like Goosen by the end was, you know, given Fundora all of the rounds when I think that there was one or two in there that went to Zoo. So I think just – the closeness of it alone. Well, I think what I noticed through the telecast and keep in mind, I'm a guy sitting on my sofa was Tim zoo had two rounds where it looked like he was about to knock out Fendora. The cut happens and Fendora battles back. And the emotion of the fight was, wow, this guy started out really slow and now he's battling back. And I think Goosen and some of the broadcasts were captivated by the resiliency of Fendora and they didn't talk about when Tim Zoo was doing good things because I think that they had a pretty wide scorecard and I think I had it seven, five Fendora, but it was closer to a draw than an eight, four, if that makes sense. And it just seemed like it was kind of like, Whoa, look at Fendora finally doing what they've always wanted him to do fight from the outside. A part of me just kind of a car, but a part of me also wondered is it easier for Fundora to do these things when a fighter's compromised and blood's in his eyes? And I think we also hit on something or you hit on something. I thought the fight was over in the third round. Totally. I didn't think the fight was going to go on. And that for me leaves a weird taste. And I don't want to be a hater on the front line because I think Fundora is a fantastic fighter, but it had a weird, the fouls and the brutality typically lead to an epic night of fights but it set an undertone that I'm rather confused by. Well, here's the thing. The difference is, is not, oh, can he do that with a guy that's hurt? He's never done that, period. And I've seen 10 of his fights probably. And I've never seen him 
fight with that mentality. It always he always defaults to his like kind of Paul Williams, but gets hit even more style. And this was the first time I felt like he asserted something different. And that's what I was impressed with. Because if he had fought the fight the way he's fought every other fight in his career, Tim Zhu was going to dominate. That was kind of the fight that we were all expecting. But I think that he's undergone a certain level of transformation that I think he deserves credit for. Because the thing is, you get knocked out like that, to come back like this against the best guy in your division, I mean, even if I even if I don't think he won, it's a, it's it's his best performance. Well, I think it's like it speaks volumes to the character of Fandora and his family. The fact that he gets brutally knocked out by Brian Mendoza doesn't doubt himself. Probably starts the fight about as bad as you can without getting knocked down. Like I mean, he's getting hit a lot, and you know, really doesn't ever lose faith that he sees himself as a world championship boxer. Yeah. And, and I think maybe like once you get knocked out, you can start having the conversations about, okay, we need to start using our length. I know we've been talking about it and then you don't do it, but we still win the fight. Now we got to actually do it because you could get dropped. You could get knocked out. That threshold's been broken. And I, I was impressed. I was impressed with that man. I was impressed with his, just how he changed his whole, his whole um, approach. Where does it rank in the tiers of great fights of this year? I mean, for me, it's it's a front runner. You know, I don't I don't know how it can't be because just what the two of them had to go through to get through the fight. And then the fact that it was a great fight and the fact that it was a pretty massive upset um, and an upset in, in, in where you still go. Wow. I, you know, the fact that Tim zoo got through that fight and, you know, was closing pretty strong. It's just like, I think the, 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 that it's, it's gotta be a front runner right now. Am I a hater for feeling like it, it lacked that unhinged, feeling of a Luis Neri, Azat Hovanesian, that what's really going to happen at a certain point? Because it definitely felt like Fandora kind of took over. Curtis. Did you feel that? Where it, it felt like Fandora was in control and Zoo would have moments, but it didn't quite have that reckless nature of where is the car going? Like, I don't know where this car is being driven. It didn't have that. Tim Zhu's not that kind of fighter, and I think that Fondora was actively making an effort to fight a more disciplined fight, and so it was brutal, but it wasn't unhinged in that in that same way. Where do both fighters sit in the division to you? I mean, now you can, you have to put Fondora at number one because he's got two belts, right? He beat the guy; you're the guy. Um, and I think Tim Zhu's got to be 1A, and a, a rematch will kind of settle that, I think, once and for all, and provided there's a, you know, it's maybe like a, their faces don't, both don't erupt in the first eight minutes. Um, I think it'll be a great rematch as well. I mean, they're, 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 you have to give them credit as the top guys. Is this their year? Is this Tim Zoo and Fandora's year in 2024? Do they come back in like September, October, and it's a rematch, and it's at maybe the T-Mobile again, and that's all we see of them this year? I, I really hope so, man. I, I think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with a good rivalry, and I don't think that, you know, I don't think we should avoid such a great rivalry just because Terrence Crawford was supposed to fight Tim Zoo next. You know what I mean? Like, I just I don't think that makes any sense. There's too many good guys at, at this weight class. Well, I think that like nowadays we're trying to market trilogies rather than let them organically happen. And something the Fandora team said was very interesting was like Manny Pacquiao took a fight on short notice and then he became Manny Pacquiao. I think that we need to sometimes allow the results to dictate what should happen. And Fandora and Tim Zoo should probably happen. So then anyone that's doubting the outcome could go, oh, you know, uh, you know, that the outcome's valid or whatever they want to say. And 
Yeah, I mean, I just, I think we're getting a little bit too much, like with some weight classes, we're looking at who's the biggest name. Like, how can we get Errol Spence in the mix? How can we get this guy in the mix? It's an interesting fight, and there's, I think the big thing we always talk about in this program is unanswered questions. There's unanswered questions from this fight. When there's unanswered questions, we need another fight. Well, and there's also other guys who have been at the weight class that I'm interested in seeing in that equation. I want to see Tim Zhu versus Jesus Ramos. Yeah, I want to see Fundora versus Lubin in a rematch. I want to see Ramos and Lubin in a rematch because I thought Ramos won the first one anyways. You know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of talent at this weight. You know what I mean? There's like six to eight guys you can make great fights with. And that's not to say I don't want to see Crawford in with one of those guys but if they're have if they're developing organic rivalries without him i also want to see those play out because it's unclear who who the guy is now yeah okay so let's go through some of these real quick because we don't have to sit up here all night it's late for you uh roly i Isak cruz what did you think of this fight that it's one of those times where I can go. That's what I thought I was going to see. Whereas Tim Zhu and Fundora gave me nothing that I thought I was going to see. That fight kind of played out exactly as I thought. You know, Cruz knows how to cut distance real good. He's real strong. Rolly's chin is up in the air and is tough of a guy. And you know, he he he's he's got a nice jab. He was boxing smart in little stretches, but I just always kind of felt like Cruz would rough him up and. The fact that Roley's chin is so up in the air would play to his advantage, and that's that's basically what played out. I thought Roley started this fight about as good as he could until he got caught. Yeah. Like, he was boxing like a masterful fight, and then he got caught, and it just changed everything. Um, how real is uh, Esau Cruz's power at this yeah, point? Yeah, I think that boy's got some pop. I think he's got little bricks. You know, and I, I don't think he's like uh, as much of a one punch guy, but he really might be, man. I mean, he buzzed Roley so bad a couple of times. I just think he's a real bruiser. He makes the ring really small. I, I you know, admittedly, we don't know how that style looks against Richardson Hitchens or against Devin Haney or against Jack Catterall or against guys that really know how to use the ring um, and aren't gonna give some of that real estate to him you know what i mean but i mean i think he's i think he's a problem man i, th I think he's the real deal at 140 and it's a stacked division i also think that he's a guy that he's able to do things that people don't always call boxing so he's able to cut the ring off use use um little foot feints throw a good shot He's get very good at predicting where you're going to go in the ring. So, like, he'll step to one side, and then he'll throw a shot to where he thinks you're going to exit. He does things that are very, like, small, great attributes that aren't what I think people look at as great boxing, which I feel like is on your back foot, throw a jab, plant your feet, throw a straight right. Like, to me, I saw a very seasoned fighter who's more than just a pressure fighter. Yeah, he's got much better defense than he gets credit for. I also did not realize he was 25 years old because I feel like I've been watching him for a while um, and to realize that he's that young and that he might have, like, upside. He's he's as good as he is right now, and he might be a guy that gets better, uh, and I think he is getting better. And, um, you know, his confidence has to be growing, and I think – you know, he's the guy that's like the only guy to give Tank a real fight. And that really was kind of a flip a coin fight. And I think until somebody else can give him a hard time, he's going to be the favorite in most of the fights he's in. What did you learn about Roley in this fight? I just don't. I, I, I like him a lot, but I just don't. I've never really felt like he was a top five, top ten kind of guy. And the Barroso fight showed some of that. Um, he did kind of stumble into that belt. He's obviously a very entertaining character. He's an entertaining fighter. Um, but I think at a certain level, he's just going to have a hard time unless he can really fix some technical things. 
Let's go into your monologue that you've been waiting to do. Eris Landy Lara, just how underrated he is. Let's start right here. Man, I dude, I mean, name somebody in modern boxing more underappreciated, more underrated than Eris Landy Lara, bro. I mean, 40 years old, he's still sharp. I'm not saying Zarafa was the greatest opponent, but he was the mandatory for the belt. He did split two fights with Jeff Horn. He's not a chump. And I think to see that Laura at 40 still has the reflexes, still has the power, still has the timing, um, particularly at middleweight, which just doesn't at the moment have that much going on in the way of matchups. I think an active Aris Landy Laura is good for the division. And I still think that he is a problem for anybody that's at the weight class right now. I mean, I don't think he's a, he's a gimme for any of them. I mean, I was impressed, man. I thought this was going to be a fire fight. I thought this was going to be a very close fight. And Lara stopped him in two rounds. Yeah. And what more could you have wanted in that performance? And it was the kind of performance where it's like, yeah, I, I still do want to see him in Janabek. You know what I mean? Like, I still do want to see him in Adames. I still want to see him in Jamal Charlo if he's going to be an active fighter. I still think that he's a guy you can put in with some of these other top guys at middleweight. And honestly, I don't know that any of them can beat him. Even this version of him. Yeah, it's it's crazy because how many basically 40-year-old men do you go, ah, this guy might be the best guy in the division? Like that, that really is the sign of greatness. When you're 40, you got the salt and pepper hair, you got a mild bald spot, you're obviously not what you once were, and you still might be the best fighter in the division. That really speaks to what you are as a fighter. Well, and if anything, dude, he's knocking guys out more now because he's really sitting down on his shots. He's not as up on his toes as he was as a younger guy. Like, maybe he's not quite as fast as he used to be, but put on one of his old fights, bro. I feel like he's at least like 90%, 85% of what he was at his absolute peak. You know what I mean? And that 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 is going to be a problem for most fighters. I mean, I think you're right. But I also think that like now he's got a little old man energy to him where he's like, I just don't want to go these freaking rounds, bro. So he's like, I'm just going to sit there. And if the nuclear bomb is there, I'm going to let it off. But it's he, not like he became easy to hit. No, you know? not at all. But I'm saying there's like a level of like. Okay, I'm going to be a little closer to you. I'm still going to do the distance, but now I'm looking to kind of land something. Whereas Lara against Freddie Hernandez probably could have done the same thing, but he was like, eh, I'll just move around a little bit. I'll look for my shots. He had a little bit of like, let me play with my food or I'll knock a guy out in one round. Like, Well, and that hasn't gotten him probably what he wanted or what he deserves based on his skill and his achievement. You know, so there has to be... There has to be some level of awareness of like, you know, when I put these guys out, it, it makes me more appealing. Isn't it weird that the most probably mm -hmm. enjoyable version for many fight fans of Aris Landy Lara is him at 40 years old? Right. I mean, Bernard Hopkins had that too, right? Where it was like once he got to the Tarver fight and the Pavlik fight and some of the later parts of his career after the Taylor fight, I think he realized it's like, yo, I have to sit down and really let my hands go. And just because I'm the hardest guy to hit in the world doesn't mean I'm going to get a decision against these young, fast guys. So a lot, the greats evolve as they get older. You know what I mean? Like Pacquiao evolved. Well, the, the, the greats are able to, ch no, no needle donaire, another great example of that, even though he had some losses, I think he's a great example of that. So I just think he's making that adjustment Longevity is a thing that doesn't get appreciated in boxing generally. You know what I mean? Like you look at who comes up on his record and there's about three different eras of really great fighters on his resume. Um, and I don't I don't think people, you know, boxing is such a hard sport when you're able to operate at a certain level for a certain period of time is, is very special. Um, no, I agree with that. 
I agree with that. So, um, so yeah, let's talk about the Julio Cesar Martinez fight. Dude, I, you you talk about the Julio Cesar. I missed Martinez. half of the fight, bro. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. You didn't miss much. I mean, he did the thing that he always does where he's really – he comes out really fast. He – you know, he hurts the kid. He drops him twice in like the second or third round. And then he just looks at him for round after round um, and probably loses the last five rounds, four rounds of the fight. And it winds up being like kind of a close fight where one judge has it a draw and the other two have him up two points. So I just, I don't, there's nothing like he's fine. I just don't get why he's a guy who gets a million chances with the types of, performances he has by the way julius armstrong you're not wrong badu jack's cut was the worst one i've ever seen that was a that was a nasty ass cut bro yeah um i i missed half of this fight it looked weird as hell um it looked frustrating i was eating dinner um you sent me a text saying basically like Julio Cesar Martinez is frustrating to watch. The rounds I saw, he looked like he was losing. Uh, it was a close fight. He wins. I mean, I've never seen someone in a five-year span lose more enthusiasm for, like of their career. Martinez in 2019, DAZN's kicking. People are very excited for him. Now in 2024, I think people are expecting him to lose an inevitable fight. Or and the thing is, even in a fight like this, where he has the gift of power and explosion, you know, being explosive, he's got the guy hurt in what looks like a fight that he had about th four opportunities to put this guy out. He lets it go on and on and on, and he actually winds up taking a ton of punishment um, to the point where he had cuts. His face was all puffy. Like I said, he probably lost the last five rounds of the fight. Um, so. He's just he 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 takes so much. He, the other thing too that drives me crazy about him is he's just there's no footwork at all. He just sort of mirrors your movement, and then if you don't want to engage, he goes, "Come on, bring it." And it's like he doesn't really initiate the contact. He's just not fun to watch, man. Emmanuel Navarrete yeah. kind of fits this bill, but a Navarrete actually wins fights. Um, Martinez well, he the ring off and has real intangible shit that he does that's tricky to deal with. Whereas it seems like the, every time out with this guy, win, lose, or draw, he's just spends a lot of time just kind of looking and waiting. It's just not fun, bro. And it, what did you think when you saw this fight? Who really won this fight? I only saw like four rounds. It felt like Cordova won three. No, it, was four. it was a draw. It was a draw. I mean, it just felt like typical, very lackluster martinez um he's busted up relying strictly on power not mm -hmm. able to cut the ring off just just basic mistakes that he continues to do time and time again and if if i'm right or just about right he's about 30 and that's when flyweights get old so i mean it's like we're getting to the end of his career essentially and he's not improving or showing intelligence or he's just doing the same thing every fight. And he's just relying on power and toughness. And I think what was fun about it at the beginning was that power was enough to just like, once he had that first explosive moment, guys couldn't handle it. And once you get up to a certain level, they can handle it. And then what else do you have? And he's never shown that he has that other thing other than the occasional um, burst you know what I mean? The occasional explosion, which oftentimes are very exciting, but they're they're few and far between. Undercard: Brian Mendoza, Surrey Bochuk. I was blown away with Surrey Bochuk and how he did, how he fought. Shout out to Surrey for giving me props too. What did you think of that fight? I I did not realize what a puncher he was. Honestly, I didn't realize that every win he had was a knockout win before Brian. Um, and Brian was boxing pretty smart and closed the fight really strong, probably won the last two rounds. But Bochuk Bo was just able to kind of stay in his chest the entire time. And I think had he not been such a hard puncher, Brian would have kept moving more. But 
he just kept pinning him and, and hitting him with really hard shots to the point where I, it almost got stopped a couple of times. And Mendoza clearly has a broken jaw, right? His, his whole entire side of his head was puffed up. Um, you know, it was it was brutal. And, and now knowing, I think, having a little more context for just how much of a power puncher he is, he's a, he, he's, he's a tough out. He really is. Because Mendoza looked pretty sharp tonight. I mean, Brian looked great. He looked he looked capable of winning. Boachuk is not just a puncher, but he has a lot of volume. And it, I think this the intangible is his country is at war with Russia, and he was actually trapped in the Ukraine. He went back when the war started to get his visa. And I don't think people understand how motivated he is by representing his country. So Boachuk in the past had not been this ferocious. I think he's motivated deeply by being a Ukrainian world champion. Yeah, well, and that's that's some real life shit. And I think that's one of those things where it's either um, a motivator or it's so overwhelming that it's a detriment. So when someone's able to use something like that as a motivator, it's it's pretty inspiring. Yeah, it's it's definitely something good. Um, any thoughts on Carmel Moten? First time you'd ever seen him. I I like him a lot, bro. But it's t- he's like just a little too young for me to really see where it's going. You know what I mean? Like I obviously see the talent and the hand speed, but it's like I just don't know about turning on the punishment meter that young. And he's fighting guys who are good enough that they're gonna throw back. Um, so I, I obviously see what everyone else sees. I just, that's a concerning. Well, I mean, I think the concern is like, you see a guy that Floyd is promoting and heavily, um, like thumbs up on and he doesn't fight like Floyd. He's a punishment guy. He's a come forward fighter. And I, I've always said, I'm a huge Kermel Moulton fan. I see a superstar in the making in him. But it's going to be interesting to see his evolution as a fighter because I think he's going to have to evolve with what he does initially and have to like merge into a style of picking his shots and then doing what he likes to do. It reminds me of, and everyone loves my dated basketball references, when Blake Griffin got into the NBA. Blake Griffin's dunking on everybody and he's playing at mock speed and all this. But really the best version of Blake Griffin was when he learned how to slow down set some screens and then he picked the times to do his fantastic highlight reel dunks. And I looked at Kremil Moulton as this is a young kid who's doing the Blake Griffin. I'm trying to highlight real dunk on everybody 82 games out of the year. When really the version we want to see in the world title fights is going to be the guy that picks and chooses four games to go for the dunks. And he has, you can see that he has that ability. You can see he has the defensive instincts and the defensive reflexes. Um, so he's clearly capable of doing it. Again, like I said, I think regardless of the style, and maybe this is just something in general, I just feel like, to me, that's a little too young to be a be pro. I mean, I'm not mad at that take. I mean, because we haven't really seen it work out that often. We haven't seen the young fighters turning pro that become generational talents just yet. I mean, maybe Fernando Vargas, but I think even at the end of the day, as great as Fernando was, he probably shortened his career by turning pro as young as he did. You know what I mean? And and turning on that punishment meter so early. Because that's that's the that's that's the one, you know, you're not gonna be able to you never get that back. So, like, when we're watching Jahai when he turns pro at 16 and we're seeing the tough fights that he's in, like, you don't get those back. And and and, and it's especially dangerous if they're talented. You know, because if they're talented, there's always going to be the urge to move them quickly. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a tricky equation. Let's go real briefly top-ranked card. What did you think of the Oscar Valdez fight? I thought Oscar looked great. I thought it was a 
a, a great way for him to kind of rejuvenate his place in the division. Um, he was dominant. He looked sharp. Um, I don't see any reason not to uh, have him right back in the mix. I mean, why, why not have him in shock or him in Venado? Yeah, I mean, I it was a tale of two fights for me when Liam Wilson was using his jab. I was like, oh, my God, he's going to break him down. This feels like Miguel Cotto versus Margarito. The minute he gave up his size, it just felt like Oscar Valdez hit his groove, started boxing, moving, and was just walking him into massive punches. And it was like, yeah, there's no path to victory here. But how did you feel about the stoppage? I felt a little bad for Liam Wilson. I didn't think he was going to win the fight. But it felt like a rough time to stop the fight because it was a 50-50 call. And given the fact that he had been basically gotten a late count in Arizona, it just like adds fuel to the fire that he's probably never going to buy a house in Arizona ever again. I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was great. I think he definitely could have kept going. But there was also, when I'm you know watching it back, it's a lot of one-way traffic. You know, at a certain point, you have to give the referee a reason to – not stop it. So I it, it is it's a tough it's a tough one to argue even if I wouldn't have stopped it. Um and I think that you know for Oscar it's it is pretty impressive with the number of tough fights he had. Like we're talking about longevity. You know, he's a he's a guy that's been around for a decade now at, at a certain at a, at a pretty high level. Um and with the but, you know the number of tough fights that he's had to still be able to be that explosive and have that kind of performance is very impressive. And to me, Oscar Valdez is a borderline hall of famer because of the way he reinvents himself, the way his spirit is never broken and the way he constantly goes after big challenges. The weirdest thing to me is how like, it doesn't seem like boxing fans as a whole take to Oscar Valdez, the way I like Oscar Valdez. It's always been strange to me. I don't know. He seems like he's maintained a certain level of fame to where Shock Foster and Venado are there saying that they want to get a fight with him. So as far as guys at 130, I mean, he's kind of the biggest name in the division at the moment. I understand what you're saying, but what I'm saying is like, I don't feel like boxing fans as a whole are like, oh God, Oscar Valdez is fighting. Let me go get like whatever I'm going to eat for the night and make sure I'm home. Like, I think amongst the fighters, people respect him. They know he has a big name. But I don't feel like he's tentpole event watching the way some of these fighters of his era are. And maybe that's just because he's not a pound-for-pound pound guy necessarily. You know what I mean? He's more in kind of like the Sean Porter lane. Um, so maybe he doesn't get the same sort of reception as a Navarrete because Navarrete has for a while been perceived as one of the best guys of the the mid lower weights. And that might be a great comparison. I just I'm a fan of a guy who's takes his role as like a a figure in the sport serious and isn't embarrassing and tries to motivate young people and stuff. I just think that's awesome. And I think we have a lot of embarrassing representations of boxing and Oscar Valdez isn't one of them. So to me, it's just a little disappointing when it seems like you have someone that does everything we ask of fighters, be resilient, come back, have a positive attitude, inspire young people, don't make terrible decisions. And then this guy's never quite getting the same acclaim as like Ryan Garcia going on TikTok and making like alt-right references basically. And that is disheartening for sure. And I think, you know, shout out to Tim Zhu and Fundora for also kind of being, you know, what we ask for as fight fans and being super respectful of each other after what was a brutal fucking fight that I'm sure they both felt like they won. Yeah, that's that's a great comparison. Our final topic of tonight, and then we're going to send you off, Dakota. Yeah, the final the final countdown, we will say. Uh, Sinise Estrada, Yoko Valle. Let's get into it. Great fight, first of all. And I think, we, you know, I've talked to a variety of people around boxing, male and female, about these 10 two-minute rounds. I think this fight was at a level where the fact, where the 10 two-minute rounds 
is truly a detriment to the fight. Like, I don't think that's true of every championship women's fight because we've talked about certain weight classes don't have the same depth. But this is one of those fights where it's like, at a bare minimum, we got to get to 12 two-minute rounds. At a bare minimum. Because when you got a fight like this, it shouldn't be the same length of time as a fucking eight-round men's fight, bro. That just doesn't sit right. That being said, I don't know how you score this fight for Yoko Valle. Like, I just no. don't understand how in any, like, maybe you could say it was a close fight, but to me, this was a clear, to me, it was a demeanor fight. The demeanor of Sinise Estrada was like, I want to be a Kobe Bryant. I want to be a Michael Jordan. I want to be a great competitor. She gets to the arena early. She's shadow boxing. To me, Valle was a great, responsible role model, a dignified champion, but she just didn't have that inherent meanness and selfishness that Estrada brought, you know? And that was the difference. I felt like Sinise is just way more competitive, and she had a little bit more tools, a lot more tools, in my opinion. And the fight, though, some wanted to say it wasn't with bad blood. The way, like the ending to the fight and the post fight interview, it just sounded like it was very personal. There was a lot of personal emotion that was kind of downplayed, I think. And I just saw someone that had more talent in Sinise Estrada and was more competitive than Yoko Valle. But Yoko Valle was coming forward and she conducted herself in a humble manner that I think some fight fans identified with. So she might have gotten rounds just for coming forward and being a figure that people liked because Sinise is like doing the matador thing and being cocky and rubbing it in her face. And I think for some fans, that's appalling. For some fans, that's appealing. I also think there's an underlying layer that some fans don't like to see women being cocky, if we're going to be honest. Like, I think that I was trying to, I was talking to my girlfriend in the other room and I'm like, why don't some fans like Sinise Estrada? And she's like, you know, some people don't like confident women. And that could be as simple as what you don't see universal cream with uh, Sinise Estrada. But those are kind of my general thoughts. Where are you going to think Dakota? I mean, I also felt like Valle fought a good fight. It's not like she didn't fight a good fight. It was the two absolute best in the weight class and Sinise is just the best she's just number one um and she had just a little bit more explosiveness she had a little bit more accuracy she had a little bit more swag she had a little bit more everything um and i felt like in most of the rounds you know they were good rounds and via was just kind of coming in second um don't know how you could have the fight for via i could see it being a six four type of fight but um, it's it's a great win for Sinise, man, and I think it just puts her in a position where it's like she really is a top five pound for pound women's fighter now, um, whether you like that she's swaggy and confident or not. How strange is that 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 actually has to be something that's added in? Um I mean, that blows my mind that like people are like, oh, man, I don't like that. She's a confident fighter who does crazy things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, there's definitely a certain brand of a sports fan that wants everyone to just be super humble and grateful and appreciative constantly. And, uh, you know, go fuck yourself. <laughs> No, I definitely hear it. Let's get to some of these questions in the chat. Boa Chuck made a name for himself. He's another guy that needs to move up to middleweight. He needs to put some meat on his bones. I mean, Boa Chuck just needs to get some great fights. I mean, I think that I personally thought he was going to beat Fandora if they had a fought. That was my gut feeling. We could be looking at the best guy in the division who's just waiting on an opportunity. I would be mad if, they, if him and, and Mendoza ran it back because Mendoza closed the show so strong that I think it kind of made the argument. Like, I, I'm not saying I got to see it the way I got to see Fundora and Zoo, but I wouldn't mind seeing that rematch.
All right, Harry, yeah, I hear you. I think it for me it was a little bit more definitive and Brian's my guy, but I don't really have those unanswered questions. I think at this point Boachuk did what needed to be asked of him. Um what's the story of the night for you, Dakota? I mean, the story of the night for me has to be the main event tonight. If you say you saw that kind of fight coming, you're full of shit. Nobody saw this kind of fight coming. Nobody saw it being this brutal. No one saw Fundora actually using his height. And 10 days ago, it wasn't even going to be Fundora. So everything about this main event was so unpredictable and exciting. And um, I think just the fact, you know, the taking a, a high-level late replacement like that is always a risk. So, it, you know, it, it makes you have even that much more respect for Tim Zhu for being willing to take that kind of fight. Um yeah, that's that's the story of the night for me, man. Shout out to Fundora. I think it's just it's such a, an incredible win for him and his family. Is Fundora's dad in the running for coach of the year? I mean, shit, bro. How can he not be? How can he not be? I mean, he's he's got two good fighters and all that stuff. Uh, I'd like to see Tim Zhu versus Serhai Boachuk. What do you think of that fight, Dakota? Love that fight. That's the beauty of 154 is there's a lot of different matchups that can be made right now that I think would be really entertaining. Don't forget about Jesus Ramos, guys. Don't forget about Jesus Ramos. I mean, Jesus Ramos got a bad decision, and now he's out of sight, out of mind. That's kind of the thing. I mean, to me, I guess the final thing I want to wrap up on tonight was kind of supposed to be the birth of Tim Zoo as a star. What does this do to Tim Zoo's U.S. invasion? It definitely changes its trajectory. You know, in the immediate sense, he was going to fight Terrence Crawford. He was going to fight some of the biggest names in boxing following this. And I think it does kind of just put him in the pack. You know, it doesn't, I don't think it really does damage to him as a fighter, but it it, it does kind of just make him one in the pack that, that of this really talented group of guys, you know. And um, there's been a lot of turnover at 154 in the last five, six years, and I think that that's made it a really interesting division. Um, you know, and I again, were he to beat Fundora in a rematch, he's back in the same spot. So it's not, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a, it's the end of the world either, especially considering the circumstances of the fight. To me, it changes his trajectory from being a superstar to a star. It, it kind of hurts maybe his ability to be a main event pay-per-view guy. If he's in the right corner, he now goes into the other corner. If he's a pay-per-view headliner, uh, I think he was really trying to go in the lane of challenging the Terrence Crawfords and the Errol Spences and being a marquee pay-per-view guy. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if he's a marquee, pay marquee pay-per-view guy after this performance. Um, I mean, I think that he still can be. I think. No, but what I'm saying is I think he's more of like a co-feature fighter on the card. I don't think he now can merit the main event unless he wins a rematch in a dominant fashion. Or he looks dominant against another top level guy. You know, if he gets in there and beats the crap out of Erickson Lubin, I mean, he's kind of right back. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't feel like between the fact that this was an incredibly close fight and the circumstances of the late replacement and the elbow and the head, I just think that he's one great performance away from people forgetting about it. But that's boxing. You're only as good as your last fight. But I think for me, there was real belief that Tim Zoo was going to take over and yep. he was going to be a star. And I think that Sebastian Fondora, kind of a goofy looking, huge framed guy, wouldn't compare it to Andy Ruiz versus Anthony Joshua quite. But it's closer to that than it isn't because this is a guy that I think most people were pretty clearly writing off. And now he's derailed a guy that I think a lot of people thought was going to be a 
big money fighter for years to come to carry promotional muscle. And yeah, and he still may be that, but the the journey to that is different now. It's no longer the trajectory of a superstar. Now it's going to be much more blue collar to get yeah. to that point because now he's faced a bump in the road where the guys like Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, they went through these type of fights and didn't lose these fights. And that's the, I think there was a big comparison being made to Tim Zhu compared to other modern great Hall of Fame trajectory fighters. And now he can get there, but he can't be identical to those iconic fighters. Yeah. And, but listen, at the end, of the, I, I think whatever, I think the loss is less damaging than like whatever maybe physical damage he took tonight or punishment he took tonight. You know, I just don't, I don't, I guess it's, it's also because I don't view losing in that way where it's just like, I feel like he can very easily redeem himself in his career and be in this back in this position. It, if he had gotten knocked out in the first round, we're having a different conversation, but you know, he got his forehead sliced open and fought 12 really brutal rounds and never even showed a, a, a tiny sign of quitting. Okay, that's our show. It's basically one in the morning for Dakota. For sure it's late, well. late here. Um, Dakota, what can people expect? I mean, next week, the card on zone isn't all that great. I'll just give people a brief preview. They're probably not going to really watch it. If you watch it, maybe we'll come back and give you a preview. It's Richardson Hitchens. He's fighting a fighter I've never heard of, but he's highly ranked. It's Diego Pacheco against Sean McCallum. McCallum's been a friend of the program. He's really good. Diego Pacheco is really good. Mark Castro, the debut of Steven Navarro, a few other fighters, but it really feels like a fight card the week after a pay-per-view. It feels like, hey, if you want to go out, go do something, you want to go to dinner, this might be your weekend to take a shot. So, um, yeah, I mean, just anything you want to do, say to the people, etc. Anything I want to do or say to the people, follow me on youtube on instagram at the slip and weave podcast uh next week we're gonna have barack bess on the show looking forward to that and uh always a pleasure my guy right on okay we'll talk to you soon